Okay, very good. So, uh, welcome everyone to the second day of uh, the course. Um, I'm going to start just uh, briefly summarizing what we did uh, yesterday. So, yesterday basically we were uh, discussing the uh, sets of uh, functions. Right, so we are interested in using some set of functions from some set, uh, some general set X in uh, R. And at the beginning, we discussed how this uh, set of functions are useful for uh, uh, supervised uh, learning. Basically, uh, for instance, using these functions, we can define a classification rule just taking the signs of the function so that this uh, classification rule will go from x to the values minus one and one and that can be used to classify uh, the values of x's into two different classes right if we are interested in a uh, uh, Having some spam filtering, for instance, we can decide if an email is spam or not a spam, uh, finding a suitable function. Okay. okay, so we were also saying that uh, uh, considering any possible function is uh, too much, that is uh, problematic. And then, uh, so the set of all these functions uh, is too big. So the idea was to, to use uh, some uh, subset <clears throat> of the function. So the idea is to use a subset of uh, all the possible functions. Uh, and this subset uh, has some inner product. Uh, it's going to be a Hilbert space. And it's going to be also a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Hilbert space. Uh, and we saw different characterizations of that type of uh, uh, the spaces, for instance, uh, just from the name of it, uh, so there is a function that we call the kernel, and then this function, what it does is that, uh, for instance, we can obtain the values of any function in the Hilbert space by doing inner products of, uh, of uh, using the kernel. Okay, so this is and this was the reproducing property, yes, right? So yesterday we were describing the properties of these uh, subspaces in a very simple scenario in which x is a finite set, so that uh, this is a very tractable linear space, finite dimensional given um, linear space, and then we saw that any linear subspace in there is automatically a reproducing kernel given space. We constructed the kernel. We constructed the we constructed the kernel from the features, and then the features from the kernel. And we were doing that, uh, seeing uh, functions as um, vectors. Right? So the functions were just vectors in in some uh, finite dimensional linear space, and then uh, the constructions of the the producing kernel Hilbert space were just basically very elementary linear algebra, right? Just uh, matrix multiplications and that sort of thing. So today uh, we are going to go to the general case. So today X is not going to be finite set, it's going to be general set. And we are going to to see functions not as uh, vectors, but as uh, functions. So, uh, of course, I mean, it's just a matter of uh, I don't know, notation or uh, trace or whatever. You can always uh, move from vectors to, to functions and also in the other direction. So, okay, so let's uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, as I said yesterday, basically everything is going to be the same as uh, yesterday plus some uh, technical uh, uh, conditions. And uh, yesterday, every, any subspace is uh, going to, uh, was a reducing kernel space. And today, we are going to need some uh, regularity conditions for that uh, to work. So basically, we are going to do exactly the same things we did yesterday, but in, with more generality. 
So we are going to call it the theorem. So we are going to call it theorem. So the theorem uh, is going to have uh, multiple steps. Let's see if I have room here, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let H be uh, a subset of functions from X to R. Uh, that is a uh, Hilbert space. And yesterday, when I described the subspaces, I just defined the, the inner product. Uh, and then I was calling it a Hilbert space. I didn't, I was not very explicit, but basically, if we are in a finite dimensional space, any inner product space is a Hilbert space because uh, any linear space is complete in the finite dimension. And so to have a Hilbert space, we need an inner product and we also need the space to be complete meaning that the Cauchy sequences converge, right? So in, in, in general, we need to, to have that uh, condition also, the space is going to be complete. So we have a Hilbert space, um, and then basically the following are equivalent. <clears throat> So we are going to characterize the uh, reduced internal Hilbert spaces with uh, multiple equivalent um, characterizations. So the first one is the regularity condition that we need to be in a situation as we were yesterday in finite dimensions. So in finite dimensions, every Hilbert space is automatically a reduced internal Hilbert space. In, uh, in the general case, we need a regularity condition which is that the evaluation functionals are going to be continuous for every point. So basically, let me see if I do it. So for every x in x, the function, the evaluation at x is a function that goes from the Hilbert space to the reals and takes a function and returns the value of the function at x that point. So basically for every x, this uh, function, this functional is going to be continuous. Okay, so that's basically the regularity condition we will need uh, for the Hilbert space in order to be a reducing character. Maybe you remember your uh, times of uh, functional analysis. Maybe some other people know. Uh, this evaluation function is a linear function. It's a linear operator, right? So if I do this uh, for the sum of two functions, I get the, the sum of the two values. So this uh, function is a linear operator. So being continuous is the same as being bounded. Uh, and being bounded basically means for this condition, is equivalent to valuation of x s, uh, which is just uh, the value of uh, at x has to be smaller or equal than some constant that depends only on x uh, and the norm of f in the Hilbert space. Okay, and this has to happen for any function. Right, so this is basically the regularity condition that we need. And okay, so now let's let's make some comments about this because this might look a little bit uh, abstract or something. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, um, if H is a finite dimensional, and this is uh, automatically satisfied, right? So if we have, if we have a um, finite dimensional uh, linear space, any linear function is continuous, right? Uh, okay. So uh, we can do it in the in the case uh, yesterday, so that you you see how 
how this goes, right? So yesterday, so let, let's imagine, so let's go back to what we did yesterday for a minute, right? So basically we are in the yesterday situation. We have uh, the set X was finite. So then we can, we might want to bound the, the values of uh, any F uh, at some uh, and at each uh, X, right? So, okay. So yesterday we saw that this is the uh, doing the inner product between uh, the section corresponding to, to I and then uh, uh, the vector that represents F, right? So F, if F is uh, K times alpha, the reproduction Boolean property gave us uh, this, right? Okay. If you don't remember exactly, you can check your notes yesterday, but this was basically, right? So yesterday we saw absolute value, right? So yesterday we saw that they, in X is finite, we always have the, we can always define the kernel, we will always have the reproduction uh, property, and the reproduction property basically says this, right? That the value of the function is the inner product with the section and the, the function. Okay. So, all right, so this is uh, this. <clears throat> and now this, uh, well, we can just write what it was. Uh, let me see if I do it uh, right. So this is C G transpose, right? So this is the matrix given by the, the features. So that uh, this is uh, the AI transpose, uh, transpose, uh, transpose, okay, alpha, right? Yes. So the type of things that we did yesterday, everything is just uh, linear algebra, everything elementary. So, okay, and this is the scalar product between these two vectors. And now we we just use it. So this was, let me see if I have room. Here. So we just use the Schwartz, and then uh, basically this is going to be a smaller or equal than the norm of this. <clears throat> so the norm of this is just uh, this, and now the norm of uh, this other guy is going to be alpha. Just using Cauchy Schwartz and just uh, a little bit of linear algebra. So anyway, and now this thing here, well, this is the kernel matrix. Uh, so this is the kernel matrix in the diagonal uh, entry. And this other thing here, well, it's just what we are trying to find, right? So this is just uh, the norm of F in H, right? F was this, right? And this is K, and this is how we define the, the thing. So this is just a refreshing of uh, what the kind of things that we did uh, yesterday. Uh, we didn't need to do this because uh, we know that in finite dimensions we can always bound, but just to to to, to, to do to do it here, right? So basically, we have bound the, the evaluation at every point by a constant that depends on the point only, and the uh, you know. okay. So all right. So this is basically saying that yesterday we we have this regularity condition. Uh, and well, okay, so now to, to have a more clear idea of what this regularity condition means, let's uh, see an example in which uh, this is this is not satisfied. So let's see an example. An example of Hilbert uh, space. A space that is not uh, that is not the uh, reproducing term and you feel like okay, or well if you like that is not satisfied that uh, 
that regularity condition. So this example is going to be, so H is going to be the set of uh, functions from zero, one to the real and that are polynomial. And the, the inner product, uh, the inner product is going to be given by the integral between C and one of yes, yes. Example. So this is a Hilbert uh, space, uh, and then this uh, this Hilbert space we don't have that. Uh, that property, uh, for instance, uh, if we consider if we consider the polynomial that are just uh, x to the n, um, what happens here? Well, so if Pn is x to the n, the norm of uh, Pn well would be doing the the integral of this integral of x to the two n. And then that integral, I now I remember because I did it yesterday, but otherwise I mean this is something you can do in uh, one minute, right? So the 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 integral of, of that, and then we take the square root is going to be two n uh, plus the forward integral, right? It would be uh, so this will be the so anyway, okay. So the norm, the norm of this uh, polynomial is going to be like this, and then uh, if we want to to have that property, we would need to be able to bound the values of this uh, in every x in that way. So. Uh, if we try to do it at one, right? So the value, so we would need to bound the one to the n, which is one, and then we would need to bound it with a constant that depends only on one, so a constant, and then the norm of the polynomial and the norm of the polynomial is uh, like this, right? So we cannot uh, do this. Right, because I mean the this uh, constant can only depend on one, not on the not on the function, right? So uh, this thing we can make it as small as possible, so we cannot choose an end that, uh, that uh, satisfies that. Right. Uh, we need this. We need to bound this uh, with something that does not depend on f and the norm of f, and we need to do this for every. So this uh, uh, Hilbert space is not uh, is not going to satisfy this, and uh, this is one possible definition of reproducing Kernel Hilbert space. So it's not a reproducing Kernel Hilbert space. Uh, let's see a couple of things more, so we have a more clear idea of what this uh, regularity condition means. <clears throat> So if we have this regularity condition, so this regularity condition means that the, I mean, the, as I said yesterday, the functions in the producing kernel Hilbert space are nice functions and uh, are smooth in some sense, right? So uh, what uh, this regularity, I mean, what, one of the implications of this regularity condition is that um, if we have, if we have, uh, that uh, a sequence of functions converges in H. So if we have convergence in H, in in the sense of the, the Hilbert space, so if F n converges uh, to F, I mean, if if we have one, right? so if we have this uh, regularity condition one, convergence in H implies. Uh, Point-wise uh, convergence. 
for everyone. Okay. So basically, uh, if we have uh, functions that converge in in terms of the norm, that implies that they have to converge also for every. Okay, so let's uh, see why is that. Well, uh, uh, gn fn minus f is a function in, in H, right? So if we have one, uh, we can bound, right? So gn is one specific function in, in, in H, so the value of uh, gn at x is uh, this, and since we can and uh, we have that. This is going to be more or equal than a function that a constant that depends on x and then the norm of uh, gn, which is the norm of fn minus f in x. Right. So just uh, I'm just writing the the, the 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 property for that specific function in H. So we have this, so that if this goes to zero, this also has to go to zero for every X. So if this goes to zero, the right side goes to zero, then this has to go to zero for every X. And then um, uh, we have this. So the functions in here are nice in the sense that uh, yeah, convergence, global convergence, if you like, implies point wise. Okay, uh, in the example, in the example before we don't have this example. Before we don't have this in the in the previous example. Uh, if we consider this this these functions, right? If we consider these functions between zero and one, so these functions uh, when n is one is uh, just this, uh, and then as we increase n. The functions uh, are like this. All of them go to to one, right? So, in terms of the the Hilbert space, uh, x n converges to the function zero. Uh, but uh, of course, one to the n does not converge to to zero. So these functions uh, converge to the function that is equal to zero, but in this point. Okay, so right. So this is basically the, the the regularity condition that we are going to need to be like in the finite dimensional case. Okay, great. So let's keep going. Questions for religion. Let's go with the maybe more useful characterizations of the, the reproducing canal given space. <laughs> For the second, so now we are going to start uh, doing the same things that we were doing yesterday. And uh, right, so this first thing yesterday we had it for free because finite dimensions is always true. And now let's start doing the same kind of things that we did yesterday. So the second characterization is that uh, the, the, the one of the sections, right? So for every x in x, there exists only one function. Ux that is going to be in the Hilbert space, such that uh, if we do the inner product of this uh, function Ux with any other function in f, we get the value of f at x. Okay. So these are the what well, yesterday we call sections, and that's the reproducing property that we saw yesterday in finite dimensions. So, okay, okay so this is the second characterization of this uh, reproducing general spaces. Um, very short comment. So, uh, well, 
let's 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 do let's do the proof or at least the, the idea of the proof. Um, so how we go from one to two. So uh, how we go from one to two is basically a consequence of the um, um, and Riet's uh, uh, representer, representer. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember this from the other years of uh, functional analysis, but basically this theorem says that if you have a linear operator that is continuous, it corresponds to the inner product of um, of some uh, function in the Hilbert space. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I guess so that and uh, so basically mm -hmm. since the uh, one means that uh, the evaluation is um, is uh, continuous for this. So since one implies that the evaluation is a continuous uh, linear uh, operator, there exists uh, one uh, function in the Hilbert space. We can call it a QX, that, uh, for which the inner product is the same as the evaluation. I was going to write something, but I guess it doesn't, it's not really necessary, right? So this is basically, I mean, if you, if you know what the real uh, representative theorem is, basically. Okay, so uh, can I, going to put, yeah. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Sure. So basically, uh, uh, this representative theorem says that if I have, if I have uh, uh, a function that is a uh, linear operator and continuous, there exists the risk that says that. Uh, since this is a linear operator, there exists some function in H, there is some function in H, let's call it a QX, let's call it a QX, such that the uh, evaluation, then this linear operator is the same as doing inner product with that uh, function. And it is f of x because that's the definition of the evaluation operator. Okay, so this is from one to two is a consequence of uh, uh, this representative theorem, and the uniqueness is uh, very easy to prove. Uh, just uh, as we did uh, yesterday, if you assume there are two, you can do the inner products among the two, and then you get that uh, they have the same value. Well, so maybe a more direct way to do it if if there are two if there are two such functions uh, you can do the the inner product of their different with uh, any f uh, and this will be zero for all f uh, and h so that uh, so that we have to be, the difference have to be zero and then okay so yeah. So this is uh, from one to two, and then from two to one. From two to one is basically what uh, we what we did before uh, for the finite dimensional case, right? So if uh, we have, uh, if we are in a case in which there exist uh, this type of uh, functions, uh, then uh, we can just use Cauchy's right? So if we if 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 we are in two the absolute value of um, of f of x is going to be the absolute value of uh, f, x, f uh, h and then using Cauchy's work now in, in, the, in the Hilbert space this is going to be um, the square root well the norm let's do it later so the norm of uh, kx uh, and then the the norm of of uh, f, and this is the constant that depends only on x. Indeed, uh, we know that this is well. We know we we will have some, but okay. Uh, I have to write. So this is going to be the kernel evaluated in x. Uh, so it's basically the same the same thing we did before, but in 
this more general case. So if we add in two, the evaluation functional is continuous because we can. Well, Okay, good. So this is the second uh, characterization in terms of the uh, sections. Yesterday I started from features and then I went to sections, but I think at least the, the proofs are easier in this order. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the sections. Now let's uh, go with the kernel. So the third equivalent characterization is that it exists a unique a function that takes pairs of the x and goes to the reals um, such that and um, Positive zero for any um, real numbers there, uh, alpha and x in x. Okay, so this is the generalization to the um, to be a semi-definite positive uh, matrix uh, when we are talking about uh, functions that people call these uh, positive uh, type uh, functions or the positive functions. So basically, the third characterization is that there exists uh, a function that is uh, like a positive, semi-definite positive uh, matrix in the sense that it satisfies this. Uh, and uh, such that uh, we have this and uh, H is the completion of H not that is um, the set of functions that are linear combinations of the uh, sections. Okay, so we have this function, and then uh, if I fix uh, one of the inputs, this is going to be a function from x to the real. So this is going to be a subset of uh, functions. So this is going to be, so the linear combinations of this uh, specific type of functions are going to be some other functions. So this guy here is going to be a, a pre-Hilbert space in which uh, I define the, the inner product as uh, alpha i beta and j alpha j x i x j okay and the, the betas are basically the, the coefficients of this other function g i'm not going to write it so this is basically what we did uh, yesterday right so we saw that uh, we can define the inner product uh, from the kernel just doing the uh, bilinear form uh, given by the, the the matrix. Yesterday, what happened was that uh, the 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 whole the whole uh, and the producing kernel hybrid space was just combinations of the sections. In general, what happens is that uh, these combinations don't give us all the space, uh, but uh, these these combinations are dense in this. So basically, if we include the conscious, yeah. So the inner product. The inner product. Okay. So the inner product. That you take some x i, which is 
Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have to make it. Right. 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 Okay. Let, let's let's make this uh, bigger. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, f is the uh, alpha alpha i. No, but let's let's make it more precise. So f is the uh, this, and then um. Oh yeah. Okay. Now because now I realize the x is here. Sorry. Yeah. That's that's a good. One. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that was uh, what makes you ask uh, this, but uh, in any case, it's good that uh, you ask because I had a typo. So, so F is going to be like this, and then G is going to be a combination, but of uh, different sections in general, right? I mean, the, the X is going to be the same for, for F and G. I don't know if that was your question, but in any case, it was a big thing because I, I fixed a typo, right? So F is going to be some combination, G is going to be a different combination, different betas and different X's, and then, and then we can define the inner product uh, just by the, Expected uh, operation, right? And uh, basically, what generalizes the what? So yesterday we were we were defining the the inner product uh, just as like this, right? So this is the same, but uh, in this uh, right. Okay. So basically, if you if you do this, you get that. Okay. So yeah. So yesterday, yesterday, this uh, this uh, Hilbert space was already the whole uh, Hilbert space. In the general case, uh, the uh, Hilbert space is going to be the completion of this, which means that uh, we add. Uh, um, so we consider the equivalent classes of the Cauchy sequences of this. Is basic so it's the same thing as you do when you construct the reals on the rationals. So uh, it does to abstract. You can think that the uh, uh, the functions in here are basically the functions uh, are limits of functions in here, and in particular, um, this set is the this set is the match. I mean, this is a little bit abstract, but uh, I guess uh, the idea is clear, right? So, uh, in finite dimensions, the functions are just uh, linear combinations of sections. In the general, the Hilbert space is going to be basically that plus some limits of this uh, type of function. Okay, well, so this the third one was uh, maybe more technical. And the proof of uh, <clears throat> so the equivalence between two and three, I'm not going to do it because it's pretty tedious. Um, and it has a name. Uh, the equivalence between two and three is the uh, called the Moore Aron Sayal. Aron Sayal. Yeah. So the idea, the idea of the proof, uh, I guess, is quite. Uh, so I mean, how you prove this uh, would be basically, uh, if you if you have the sections, you can define the you can define the kernel. You can define the kernel using sections. Uh, and the the way that we saw yesterday, right? Um, and then basically. From two to three, you have to prove that uh, with this definition is a positive type of function. And basically, as you can imagine, the most technical part is uh, solving that uh, doing the completion of this. You can get the other thing, but that's so I'm not going to do it. You can find it in the in the number. Okay, so this is uh, so this is basically says that uh, we, as we saw yesterday, we could. Uh, so when we work with a uh, representation in space, we can say what are the sections or equivalent. Uh, we can say what is the kernel. Uh, and these two guys are unique, right? Uh, there is, I guess as you remember from yesterday, there is a third, uh, third way to construct the representation in space. Can you elaborate on what each of those views means? Or this one. So, so yeah, like the second one, 
seems like it's a representation. So, well, is in I mean in in general people I mean tend to work with the with the kernel on right, and then the the sections. So the sections are basically if you think in matrix is just picking uh, one column of the of the kernel, or if you think in in terms of functions is basically I fix uh, one of the inputs and and then I get a function. So, um, so I mean, we could we could uh, directly go to the kernels. Uh, uh, at least in terms of the proof, is uh, easier to go this way because the equivalence between this and this is pretty simple. To, pretty simple to see. Um, so, yeah, um, sections. Yeah, I mean. I guess it depends on the thing. So, but then, yeah. Uh, I think working only with sections is not common at all. I guess uh, people uh, would work uh, directly on kernels. Uh, but but I think it's, it's interesting the, the, the sections. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit more later about this, later today, and maybe also other day. So, yeah. For the for uh, to imply uh, three like this this equivalence, do we need to assume that the kernel is positive definite or semi positive definite? Well, it is so in in, in here is yeah, semi definite. I mean the, the generalization of semi definite. Is. So um, as we said yesterday, um, we don't need we don't need them. Um, we don't need the features to be linearly independent. And so basically the, so if the kernel is a strictly positive definite in finite dimensions, that would mean the Hilbert space is all the, the whole space, right? Because the kernel is a matrix of the size of all the space. So strictly definite positive uh, in finite dimensions would mean the Hilbert space is all the space. And, we don't really want to work with all the space of the functions. Um, uh, okay. I guess you are going to something different. Uh, okay, yeah, so I mean, in some case, yeah, I guess maybe you are saying, I mean, th this might be strictly positive for finite, uh, for finite axis, yeah. yeah. I, I was also asking because I was thinking okay. the more, uh, I don't I don't know how to pronounce that. Okay. And they asked like for the theorem, it's like suppose K is a symmetric positive definite kernel on the set X, then there is a unique yeah. number space. So okay, okay. So, okay, I guess, I guess that's the matter of, uh, that's the matter of how they call uh, a function that satisfies it. Okay. Uh, some people call it the positive type, uh, some, People call it a positive definite uh, function. Okay. Uh, so, okay, good. Uh, um, okay, so let, let's go with the the, the remaining uh, aspect of this, the 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 feature, right? We have not talked about the features, so let's do the characterization in terms of features. Should I remove? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's keep it for now. I don't know if I'm going to prove this part. Let's see how much time we have. But if you are interested, uh, I was thinking, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they're doing many proofs or little proofs, or maybe you tell me if you feel like uh, more or less. Proofs. Okay, so the, the fourth uh, characterization, the Google, the fourth. Uh, Equivalent characterization is the construction of the features. So basically, the fourth characterization is that there exists a, a function C from X to some uh, Hilbert space. This is basically what you asked the other day. So yesterday, we were uh, considering features that go to RD, but this is uh, for any Hilbert space. Um, Hilbert space. So there exists a function from X to, to a Hilbert space such that um, 
the Hilbert space H is given by functions uh, such that the values of the function that that such that there exists some element of F such that um, the values of F are given by the inner product of that feature map evaluated at X and the element mu in F. So it doesn't need to be a space of function, just any Hilbert space. Uh, okay. So this is basically the same thing we did yesterday, right? So I'm trying to also use the same notation as yesterday. Yesterday we did it for the specific case in which uh, F is R to the D, right? So this mu was just on the vector of size D, and we were considering functions that are linear in the feature space, right? So yesterday, 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 So yesterday, the feature map, we defined it there like this. And then we were considering functions that were linear in the future space. So functions that were like this. Right? So we were consider so it's the same thing, but the, this is more general. Yesterday, we were doing for a specific case in which uh, the Future spaces are these. So today we are doing in in generality, and, and this generality is interesting. As uh, is interesting and also related with Inigo's question before. So okay, so H is going to be this set of functions, uh, and uh, the 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 norm <laughs> the norm in H we can. We can obtain it uh, using the feature map, basically the same thing we did yesterday at the end. So basically the norm is going to be the infimum over the mu's uh, such that, um, so of course in here I'm saying that exists one mu doesn't need to be unique. So this is going to be the infimum over all the norms uh, in F of the mu's that represents that F. So the same thing as yesterday, but now in more generality and instead of writing things in terms of vectors, we are writing them in, in, in terms of just function. But I want to stress that this is the same thing that we did. Okay, so this is the fourth uh, characterization. And so this is the, so this is seen in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space as uh, linear functions in this uh, feature space. So, at least uh, do some part of the proof. Yeah, yeah listen to me. And then if uh, you are interested, we can continue. If not, we can go for the coffee. Uh, yeah, now I think I'm going to do this. Yes, we can remember or you have it in your notes. Okay, so let's see why this uh, fourth characterization is equivalent to the others. So let's first do the, the easy one. The easy one is uh, how to go from three or from, from two or from three, which is basically the same to four. So we have the sections, we have the sections, and um, we have the sections, and we want to find uh, this uh, feature map and, the, and, and, and check that H is given like this and check that the norm is given. So, right? so, okay, so we have the sections and we, or the, the kernel, and we want to find the future. So, any idea? 
This is this is what you see. So okay, I'm going to give a hint. So here the 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 Hilbert space can be any Hilbert space, right? So we want to prove that we want to go from three to four. We just need to find some uh, C, right? So we want to find some C that satisfies all of this. So for instance, we can choose whatever Hilbert space we like. So the how to how to define so we have the we have the sections or the kernel and we want to define a, a feature map. What is the Hilbert space that makes things easy or as a as a feature as a feature space? So can be any Hilbert space. What so there is only one Hilbert space that then H. Okay. So we can so we can take this going to H. So we didn't did that. We didn't did yes this yesterday. So okay, let me see uh, what this would mean and what did yet what we did yesterday. Right. So uh, the subspace H was a subspace was subspace generated by the features, right? And later we saw that the that subspace was also generated by the sections. So the sections could be also features. They are not going to be linearly independent, but that's totally discernible uh, set of features, right? So basically we can consider a feature map that takes X and takes it uh, to the, uh, this function if we are using the kernel or it uh, takes it to the, the section. So this is so this is the uh, elements in H, right? And, and so this feature map. So this is a perfectly valid uh, feature map from X to uh, some uh, Hilbert space. This uh, feature map is uh, what people call the canonical feature map in the in uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So as we said yesterday. For the same uh, representation of the space, we can have many different uh, features. Uh, uh, and this is one type of uh, feature, and this is what people call canonical, because I guess that only depends on the kernel, that, uh, and the kernel is unique. Okay, so let's see if this uh, does what we wanted. So, okay, so we have, so let's define this uh, C, and now let's see. If we have that, well, so the so now, um, right? So we have a function, and then we want to find an element in now this Hilbert space that we have and that. Uh, so uh, that's just the uh, reproducing property, right? So if now, so so this is going to be C of x and and then, well, sorry. Right. So if we want to get this, right? So we want to we want to see that there exists some element in the Hilbert space such that the value of f is uh, given by this. And so this is the feature map. And now in here we have to put uh, an element of h that satisfies this. So it should be so. So basically. Yes, kind of, I don't know. Uh, so it's uh, for every F in H there exists an element in, in, in H, which is F itself such that. Uh... Okay, so, right. So the, the, the set is fine. Indeed, <clears throat> indeed uh, this is the only way we can do it, right? Just as before, right? So if there are two, if there are two, if there are two elements, right? So if if there is another uh, mu in H that uh, gives me this, um, then we will have. If there is another mu in H that also gives me this, uh, as uh, well. So then since. Since this is the kernel for that H, using again the reproducing property, this is going to be 
So, um, in general, in general, the element in F that gives me the function does not need to be unique. In this specific case, it's unique. It has to be F itself. Okay, so since the, uh, okay, and then maybe the rest I don't write it. So since, so now as uh, I just said here, basically there is only one element in the, in here that uh, gives me this. So then this is the, so, and, and that's F, right? So this is just saying that the norm of F is the norm of F. Everything is also elementary. Um, maybe it gets a little bit confusing because there are uh, three or four different things, but then. So the direction from two or three to four is uh, easy. The other direction is not that simple. So I'm going to make the, I'm going to give the idea and then you tell me if you like uh, more details or not, for week of record. <clears throat> so this is the direction from two or three to four. And now let's do, let's do, Let's do from four to two. Okay, so now uh, we have we have um, a feature map into some uh, Hilbert space F. Now this F does not need to be H. And we are starting from four, so we just know that there exists uh, this that satisfies this and satisfies that. Right. So if we are trying to 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 Mm, up to we need to define what are these uh, what are these uh, functions um, I'm going to do it with next primer so how can we define these functions right so uh, well all the functions since uh, we so we have that four is uh, is uh, satisfied the Hilbert space is given by functions like this. So now we are defining, we are defining this function. So we are going to define this function as the function given by, so this function is going to be given by a C of X, right? I'm just following this, so the function, we are going to define it like this. And then in here, uh, we are going to put in here, we are going to put uh, another another element of uh, F, right? Uh, which element of F uh, we should put uh, to have the sections, I think, is also kind of uh, direct, right? So we can do this. Right. And this was also what we were discussing yesterday, right? So this is basically what we call the kernel trick, right? So, the, the, so that was the, the plan from the beginning, right? So to have uh, that the kernel corresponds to the inner product so in the, the future space, right? So if we are in four, in we are in four, we can define these functions. These are totally valid functions, right? And these functions are going to be in H because we have that uh, this is satisfied. So these are going to be the so these are going to be the, the sections, and then uh, then uh, well so the fact that the, this function so the fact that this function is in H is uh, obvious right because uh, we we have uh, that this is satisfied and um, and now the thing that uh, remains to be proven is that uh, we have the reproducing property right so we need to prove that for every f, if we do the inner product of this function that we define that way, this is going to give us the value. And this is a bit tedious, not very tedious. So uh, do you feel like uh, doing it or do we go for a coffee? And uh, maybe do it uh, later. It should be five minutes. So uh, nobody, five minutes is okay. Okay, so let's 
Let's do five minutes. Maybe I'm not going to do every step because uh, this proof uh, I, I had in mind to do it uh, because it's also related with the proof that we did yesterday and similar ideas of things that we are going to do uh, in the future. Okay, so we want to prove this, right? So you want to prove uh, that uh, this is actually a section on that we have the, the reproducing property. So we want to prove this and we have that four is satisfied, right? So this stuff we already used. Now we want to prove something about the inner product in H, uh, but uh, in four we only know how to do norms, right? So yesterday I said that the uh, if you know how to compute norms, uh, you also know how to compute inner products, but I didn't, I didn't write the details. It's straightforward. I don't know if you have done this before, but basically the, the, what we can do is uh, to, to do the inner product of the sum of the two things in itself. So this thing, this thing, uh, on one hand is uh, is the norm of the sum right. and this uh, stuff uh, we know how to compute because we can use that uh, that uh, right now we are trying to we are trying to see what what is this uh, right so this uh, now is the norm of f square the norm of k x square uh, plus two times the uh, and so basically the inner product between f and k x prima we can use it we can compute it just using just knowing how to do norms because it's going to be the difference between the norm of the sum minus the So knowing the knowing the norms is uh, enough. Okay, so basically our goal. So to prove this, we need to prove that uh, this uh, uh, thing here is f at x prime. Right. So this is what we want to prove. So let's uh, do it. Uh, we just need to do two things. Uh, so the first thing we need to to show is that <clears throat> the norm of k x prime in H is the same as the norm of uh, c x prime in uh, this is one thing, right? So basically, this element of f is what represents this function in f, right? following the what we did before. So we need to show that these two things are the same. Uh, from here, basically, we have that this uh, this is the infinity over all the views in f. Uh, for which uh, the x prime in x is the same as c x u. Uh, so this is uh, that. Uh, we know that this guy is one of the uh, these mu, but now we don't know if this is unique or not. Uh, so how we prove it is uh, the same idea of the proof. Uh, yes, of the uh, yesterday at the end, so basically <clears throat> we can consider a subspace of uh, functions. Uh, how to okay, let's, let's still call it mu. So uh, so these are going to be elements in in F such that g x mu is zero for any x in x. Right. So. This was what yesterday I said it was the kernel of the uh, uh, C. Right. I, 
went yesterday in finally dimensional like well this and then I when I went home I realized that in English people don't use this way of uh, writing things and maybe kernel was confusing with some other kernel but uh, with this I mean the the null space uh, of the uh, English speakers. Okay, so <laughs> which is basically which is basically this uh, subspace. Okay, so basically the proof is uh, the same as uh, yesterday. We if we prove that this set of mu is uh, C x prima. So C x prima is always going to be here. So we just need to prove that uh, this set is this specific element plus any other element that is here. Uh, okay. So how to prove this is exactly the same as and the same proof as yesterday. So I'm not going to, to do it. So how to prove that these two things is exactly the same thing. Also, this guy is orthogonal to element any element of M, just because M is defined this way for every X, in particular for X prima. It's basically, so this proof is exactly the same as yesterday changing <laughs> a, a matrix operation by this, but this exactly. <laughs> so these two things are the same, and now this is uh, orthogonal to any element in M, so as we said yesterday, that the, the way to make this as small as possible is if we pick uh, if we pick exactly the same. Okay. The proof is exactly the same as uh, yesterday. So I'm not going to do more the steps. Okay, so this is the first thing. The second thing that we need is that if um, the norm of F in H is given by some specific element of uh, F. Uh, then we have that the norm of F um, plus Kx in H is given by the norm of uh, U F plus um, Plus, 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 uh, how we call it? C x prime. So basically, yeah, okay, so basically, right. so if the norm of f is given by mu f and the norm of kx is given by this uh, other guy, the norm of the sum is given by the sum of the, of this uh, and this. Um, how to prove it is again, just uh, using exactly the same thing with the same uh, with the same subset M. So I'm not going to do it because it's uh, exactly the exactly the same thing. So the, the the idea here, what is what is happening is that the uh, the mu's that represent the same function can be multiple mu's, but the one that is uh, uh, giving us the norm is the is the mu that happens to be orthogonal to to this to this x, and when we add a two, is going to be, keep uh, being orthogonal. Yeah. The relation of that specific root to to select one representation is is the only possible choice, or you could um, this is another criteria. So you mean what, what, what criteria? Instead of, of defining the norm with the infimum with the inf. Uh, okay, I, I don't know. I want to use another possible choice. Not really, not really. So um not really. Because I mean we saw before that the two implies four, right? So uh, if we really want to have uh, two, if we really want to have two, we have to have uh, four. Right? And four uh, is H has to be like this. The norm of H has to be like that. So that's... Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, hmm. 
Okay, yeah. I mean, that might be because, I mean, in the, the proof, right? So in the proof I did, in the proof I did that the mu was unique, right? So when I prove uh, from two to four, the mu was unique. So then this infimum didn't make it, didn't make any sense, right? And didn't make any sense. So, uh, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, for any, <clears throat> Right. So basically, uh, I mean, you might be thinking, okay, if if I use two different uh, two different um, uh, feature maps, and both uh, satisfy these two things, I'm going to recover the same page. That might be your question. Um, so then, uh, but th this is basically what we are doing now, right? So in when we are doing well, we are going from four to, to, to two, we are just uh, using any file. So uh, starting from any file that satisfies this, we are going to arrive uh, to two, right? Yeah, so yeah, basically, yeah, this is, uh, this is necessary to, to define the norm and this one. Okay, yeah, so as I said, uh, so basically this other step is basically just uh, Again, doing the same the same reasoning as before and as in yesterday. And once we have these two little things, uh, we can go here and substitute the stuff, right? So basically, uh, this okay, I think I have room to make it here. So this is going to be the norm of U F plus C X prima in uh, F. And minus u f in f minus c x prima in f and divided by two. And we are substituting right, the norms by the norm by the norms in h by the norms in f. And now, well, now, uh, well, f is a Hilbert space, right? So this uh, computation we did. Uh, is going to work also in F, right? So this uh, uh, operation with the norms is going to give us the inner product between between mu F and C X uh, right in F. Right. So right. So if we can. If we can write inner products in uh, Hilbert space uh, with norms this way, uh, what is what work in H is going to work exactly the same in F. Right? So, right? Okay. So this thing is going to be that, and now we are done, right? Because uh, we were uh, assuming that four is correct, uh, so then this is uh, F in H diagram, and that's what we wanted to. Okay, very good. So, yeah, if there is no question, yeah. maybe I missed something, but yeah, in the second, in the second row, yeah, you use that property the last, uh, I don't know, no, you want to. So, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, I was saying that the second thing that we have to prove is, is then if the norm of F is the norm of uh, mu F then the norm of the sum is going to be this. And I said that I'm not going to do the this is exactly the same, the same proof here. So once we have that this is equal to this and this is equal to that, we just substitute here. Okay, very good. So if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, stop here. So after the coffee, okay, so this uh, hour was, uh, the hour about the general reposing kernel hybrid spaces, uh, I think we are done. Uh, after the coffee, we are going to do examples of reposing kernel hybrid spaces. And that would be the end of uh, reposing kernel hybrid spaces in general. From tomorrow, we will be talking about the applications for machine learning okay. until Friday. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so let's.
Let's uh, continue. As I said uh, before, now we are going to discuss uh, two examples and maybe a little bit more, but basically two examples. Uh, uh, and this will end the general discussion about the producing energy in spaces. Tomorrow we will go with the applications in machine learning. So the first example, the first example is a polynomial uh, up to degree K. So in this uh, examples today, the X is always going to be in RD. And we are going to talk first about the polynomial. So this is an example I talked uh, yesterday at the beginning of the course, uh, right? So basically <clears throat> something that seems reasonable is to define the components of the feature map to define the components of the feature maps as uh, some monomials, right? So if we define the components of the feature map as monomials, then the functions that we will be considering are going to be linear combinations of those monomials, which are going to be polynomials, right? So, and so basically we have the components, uh, so each monomial is going to be something like this. To every component, we do the power to some uh, uh, integer. Uh, so that the index I put here is basically the multi-index of all the layers. Right? Okay, so basically every monomial is something like this. Uh, and uh, okay, and that's basically it. So we can just uh, transform the x's into all these monomials. Uh, how many monomials we will have, right? So if we are saying that the degree uh, will be up to k, so basically the sum of the exponents uh, in here will be smaller or equal than k, right? And then we can have we can have many uh, monomials. So the idea is that we are going to define the feature mapping as um, transforming the x into a vector formed by, in this case, by these uh, monomials. And yeah, this, so this seems like a good idea. We saw an example the first day in which uh, just uh, doing the squares that uh, help us to have a classification rule much more interesting than just the linear. So we can keep doing this for uh, cubes uh, and more and more powers, right? Okay, so this is basically uh, what we can do for polynomials. What's the problem here? So the problem here is that the number of uh, components in here, the number of components uh, is going to be large. Right. So the number of the number of different monomials that we can have uh, grows uh, weekly with the degree and also with the dimensionality of the of the original x. Right? We are for everyone, right? So, uh, right, the number of different monomials that we can have, uh, if we have a reasonable big uh, number of components and we want to go with uh, somehow high degree, this is going to be very large. This grows exponentially with the degree and so on. And we could even count how many they are, but it doesn't really matter a lot. Okay, so that's the problem. So the, the, the so in here we will move uh, x to a very 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 high dimensional space. I mean, this is one of the problems of this uh, type of uh, reproducing relative spaces. But okay, and the fact that the, if we do this uh, feature map, uh, we will end up having a <clears throat> reproducing relative space is just because at the end of the day this will be a 
finite dimensional Hilbert space because the right is just polynomials up to degree k. So in this example, uh, okay. So now let's let's see what would be a good kernel for this and why the kernel can be useful in this case. Okay, so we were saying, right? So the plan is that the kernel represents the inner product, the inner product of um, of two points in future space, right? So I'm going to use Y, not to confuse with labels, but just to have the more reasonable notation, right? So if we do the the inner product of in a feature space corresponding to diff to two different uh, axes, right? So we do this uh, in the inner product between these things, and each uh, component is something like this. When we do the inner product, uh, what we have we have a sum of uh, many many things. Uh, <coughs> So we will be multiplying. We will be multiplying the, the monomials corresponding with the x and the monomials corresponding with the y for the same exponents. And then adding all of them uh, for all possible combinations in which the <coughs> The greens are smaller or equal than k. So this is just I'm doing it with symbols, but yeah, let me know uh, how is this, right? So this uh, we can maybe write in a way that is going to be useful in a minute as x1, y1, i, i, 1, x, b, y, b, i, Right. Okay. So this is fine. So this will be this could be a kernel, right? So we could define the kernel just as uh, this quantity. Right? What is the problem with this? Uh, uh, so the problem with this is that in here, the if we want to go and compute these things, right? So we want to go and compute these things. If we want to compute the inner product between two elements in future space, we will need to do all these operations. And this is uh, many, many operations here, right? So for every term, uh, we will need to do like uh, 2D multiplications, and then we will need to do that for as many terms as uh, we have here. And the number of terms uh, is basically the number of monomials that is uh, exponential with K. So if we want to compute this, it will take forever. Right? As as long as we have, I don't know, if, if uh, the dimensionality of x is I don't know, 100, and we want to do uh, polynomials up to degree 10, this will take forever. Right? So we don't really want to do this. Uh, what we can do instead is, so the, the right type of kernel for these cases is uh, something like this. <clears throat> So uh, if we define the kernel this way, if we define the kernel this way, so we are doing the scalar product of x times y, then we add uh, some constant and then we do the kth power. This thing, um, and this thing is going to be what? Well, so this is going to be um, this, uh, in here we will have, X one, Y one, that's what we have. X and Y D, right? And then when we do the the power, we will be doing the power of these sums plus C. So at the end of the day, we will get a X one, Y one, power of something, and X D, Y D. Some other power, the C is going to be with some other power. Uh, and then we will have some constant here that depends on that depends on this other power. Right? So this is just uh, doing the 
de, de multinomial. De eso. We have the sum of uh, these d plus one uh, terms uh, to the k, so at the end that's going to be the sum of uh, a bunch of uh, terms, and each one of them will be doing some powers of the, the terms, and basically the 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 thing is that this sum the sum of the exponents is going to be equal to k. Right. These constants that I'm not writing what they are, these are going to be these combinatorial numbers. I'm not doing it exactly because it doesn't really matter, right? But I guess you get your, you get the point. So if I have this expression and I do the power of k, I'm going to get a, uh, the sum of many terms, and each term is going to be is going to be like this term here times some uh, some constant. Right. This is just doing multinomial thing. What are these constants uh, is not really that relevant, but the point is that uh, the value of this expression, which is this, is going to be basically the same as this. The only difference is that we will have some constants here. Right? So if instead of defining the feature mapping just as the monomial, I define the feature, the feature mapping using the square roots of this uh, constant here. Uh, do I need to write that? Okay, yes. So we can define the we can define the the feature as this. Of course, well I didn't say it, but uh, this constant has to be positive. These other constants are going to be positive because are going to be combinatorial numbers. So we can define this and then the rest the rest uh, the same as before. <laughs> oh. So if we define the features instead of uh, like this with these other constants that don't really make a big difference, uh, then we will have that the, the inner product of this, uh, let's put it there, tilde. So the inner product of this is going to be equal to this. Uh, so the point of uh, these things is to show you an example in which uh, evaluating the kernel is much better than going to the feature representation and do the things in feature space. Uh, if we go this way and we represent x in feature space, y in feature space, and then do the, the inner product, we will be doing many, 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 many operations, right? Because we will have many, many terms. However, if we compute this, this is much cheaper. In here, we just do the multiplications and then we do power to the k way less operations than if we do the feature representation and do so this is uh, an example so this is the, i mean this kernel is not very frequent in practice but yeah, sometimes uh, people use it yeah and this is an example in which the in which the kernel trick let's say meaning using the kernel instead of the feature representation give us a boost in efficiency. Uh, what else? Okay. So, um, what else we can do about, talk about this example? So uh, as you can imagine, uh, using kernels and using using polynomials and going to very high degrees doesn't sound like a very good idea. So one way to say this is yeah. that uh, this quantity here is going to increase uh, very, very quickly if we if k is uh, reasonably high. Right. So one of the one of the properties, one of the nice properties of uh, the Poisson kernel hybrid spaces that I didn't mention before, is that uh, we always have this uh, square root of 
okay, xx, the norm of f, right? We, we said this before, and this was useful because uh, then we can ensure point-wise convergence if the things converge in the norm here. Uh, so this other, other nice thing of this is that uh, if we have a bound for this for this quantity for the value of the kernel in the in the diagonal, if we have a bound for that, let's call this uh, m. M. So m is going to be a bound for the square root of the the values of of this. Then the values in a specific points are controlled by the norm of the function. So basically, in a kernel reproducing Hilbert space, if we are able to control the norm, we are able to control the value of the functions. So the, in in every point. So this is a, if this is a bound in every point. Uh, so this quantity, the values of the kernel in the diagonal when we evaluate for the same x, is important that is a small because otherwise if this is i don't know 10 to the 10 or whatever even if we make this very small the values of the function can be can oscillate a lot and we and we really want functions that are simple that are small and so i'm saying this because uh, in here right, so if k is um, sizable uh, this quantity can grow very quickly, right? Yeah. At least if, so if C is bigger than one, this grows very quickly and there we will have a very bad bounce here. If C is smaller than one, basically what happens is that you put very, very small coefficient in the high, in the monomials with high degree. Okay. So you lose you lose the you lose the, the so basically at the end you are not using all the all the monomials. Okay, so this is the example of uh, polynomials. As I said, not the most interesting example in practice, but uh, maybe useful to fix uh, some ideas. Now let's do the the most common example in practice, which is the Gaussian curve. Um, I wanted to discuss uh, a little bit uh, in detail the Gaussian kernel, but I don't want to make today's class very, very boring, very technical, but let's see. Uh, okay, go center. So this is uh, by far the most uh, common, the most common case in practice. Um, so let's uh, study this uh, example in some detail. So basically, in this case, the the kernel is defined as the exponential. So the, the kernel depends depends on one parameter uh, sigma. So the kernel depends on sigma, and this sigma is called the scaling parameter. Okay, and the kernel is defined like this. <coughs> Uh, okay, so now let's see how are the functions in the reproducing kernel kind of hybrid space corresponding to this. Uh, okay, so well, uh, one way to to try to see what are the functions in these reproducing kernel kind of hybrid spaces is to see them as uh, linear combinations of uh, sections, right? So as the H naught I put before, right? So basically, the functions. So the functions in the 
not in all H, but at least in a dense uh, subspace of H are going to be linear combinations of, of sections, right? So these uh, functions are going to be some combinations of uh, this type of functions. So how are these functions? So these functions are combinations like this. So let's make a picture to start having some idea of uh, how are these functions. Uh, each one of these, each one of these uh, function is going to be a, a Gaussian belt centered at the different uh, x. So each one of these functions are going to be maybe something like this. Uh, here. Uh, yeah. And then maybe some of them can be negative. Let's go. So the so the coefficients here can be either positive or negative, bigger or smaller. Um, okay. This might be enough, right? So if these are the components, when we when we combine all of them. When we combine all of them, we get the, the function. Let me see if I make a picture that is representative. And in here, it will go down and then go up again. Right? So, <clears throat> and then maybe if the, there is another Gaussian here, it will get a negative. So basically, with this type of uh, building blocks, with this type of building blocks, we can get very general functions. With this type of building blocks, we can get very general, very general functions. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, let's study this a little bit more. So if, so if this is the figure for some specific uh, sigma, if we make uh, this sigma smaller, right? So if we make this sigma smaller, basically we are uh, having Gaussian belts uh, that are thinner, right? So if I if we reduce the scaling parameter, maybe the the components are going to be like this, uh, and the final result is going to be uh, something like this, right? Less is more. Right? So basically, uh, using a bigger scaling parameter makes the final function smoother than if the scaling parameter is uh, smaller. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, some intuition about this function. Uh, however, this is not the usual way we think about functions. Right? So I mean, we can get some ideas about uh, how are the functions by doing these figures or thinking a little bit about the, how are these components. But I think it's a good idea if we study these functions in some more detail uh, using some tools that are more common to study functions. So now we are going to go a little bit uh, to the uh, analysis uh, work. So I don't want to do the, this class today very dense, but I think it's uh, worthwhile to, to do this in a, uh, in frequent uh, at least for uh, the engineers in the room, uh, this is uh, useful. I think in mathematics, yeah, maybe the interpretation of the frequencies are not very common, but let's see. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to, to describe these functions in the uh, frequency domain. So basically, we are going to see how are the, the Fourier transform of the functions in this. Uh, uh, the blue synchronous field space. Okay, so basically, what's going to happen is that the 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 uh, uh, h given by a Gaussian kernel given by a Gaussian kernel is a set of functions. So the functions are going to be continued. I'm going to do it only for the, for the, the reals are, are going to be continuous that are going to be absolute integrable also. Um, 
So the fact that they are going to be continuous, I think is clear because we will be basically doing uh, combinations of these uh, Gaussian kernels. Uh, okay. So they are going to be continuous, absolutely integrable. And also, uh, if we do the Fourier transform of the function, we take the modulus square, so that's the that's called the spectral density of the function. We are going to see in a minute what is this. So if we if we consider the spectral density of this function, basically the spectral density decreases very fast as we increase the as we increase the, the frequencies. So it, it decreases exponentially fast. So basically what happens is that if we do the integral with respect to uh, plus uh, ta, 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 ta. sigma mega divided by two, this has to be uh, fine. Okay. Let's see what this means. Uh, I guess all of you had uh, some Fourier uh, analysis in, in your life. Uh, so basically, the Fourier transform in 1D is uh, just going to be I take the function and I integrate it with respect to the with respect to exponentials and I do this with respect to x. So this gives me the Fourier transform. And uh, if I have the Fourier transform, I can come back to the original function. <coughs> By doing something very similar, but changing the sign. Uh, okay, so in here I'm putting the, the modulus uh, the square modulus because this can be a com complex number and uh, we integrate it with respect to that and we get uh, something fine. Um, uh, if you are not very familiar with the uh, frequency domain of uh, functions, let's, uh, let's see what, what this uh, thing means. Uh, well, so if you have a function, if you have a function that is, I don't know, uh, cosine or a uh, sine, right? Uh, that is uh, uh, low frequency in the sense that uh, the, the periodicity is uh, uh, kind of uh, big. So this will mean that the, so the, if this is uh, f of x, the modulus of the in frequency domain. So basically, this only has one frequency. So the modulus in frequency domain will only have, uh, will be only for one frequency and the, the negative, and this will be a small. Right? So this is, uh, if this is the cosine of W times X, right? And this is a low frequency, low frequency signal, meaning that the, uh, Frequency domain, the, the frequency is small, right? And this is very small, right? So basically, what I'm trying to say is that one way to describe the smoothness of a function is in terms of the, the frequencies of the function. Right? So this is very small, small frequencies. If uh, now we we have something with a higher frequency, something like this. Uh, if we look at it in the Fourier domain, the frequencies are going to be much higher. So you can think this is the cosine of uh, x, and this is the cosine of 100 times x. So uh, higher frequency, right? Higher frequency in uh, Fourier domain. So uh, this function. So basically, one way to, to describe the smoothness is in terms of the, the frequencies of the function. Okay. And then if, uh, for instance, we add uh, these two functions, if we add uh, something with low frequency and something with high frequency, we will end up having some. Yes. Okay. 
basically. Here we have the low frequency component and also the high frequency components. Okay. So basically, these type of functions, the functions that are going to be in this uh, recursive kernel field space, are functions that can have high frequency components. So this um, might be not zero for a very large uh, Ws, but the, and the high frequency components have to be very, very, very small because they have to, because they inter if we multiply by this exponential, the final result has to be finite. Okay. So basically, the functions here, if we look at them in the frequency domain, for low frequencies can be whatever, but for high frequencies, they have to decrease uh, exponentially fast. Okay. So if we look at this, uh, if we look at these uh, functions in the frequency domain, they the, uh, they can have high frequencies, but very little and so this might have small little but uh, very very teeny tiny right the, the high frequency components have to decrease exponentially fast if we want the final result to be to be fine okay so this uh, so the functions in this uh, Hilbert space are smooth in that sense they can have high frequencies, but uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, okay. Um, what else I want to say about this? Uh, how much uh, high frequency content these these functions can have is also determined by by sigma. Right. So if uh, sigma is a small, if sigma is a small we allow more high frequencies, right? So if we, uh, so basically the, the exponential here, if a sigma is a small, it does not need to decrease as fast. And so for the sigma is small, we have more uh, higher frequency components than if a sigma is large. If sigma is large, this has to decrease much quicker, right? Because this is much bigger. And that's also basically what I was showing before in the in the picture. If the bell, if the if sigma is big, the functions that we are doing combinations are going to be thicker. If a sigma is a small, the functions we are going to do combinations are smaller, and the final result, the final result uh, will have will be less smooth, more higher frequency component. Yes. Can you repeat what are you representing in the right uh, graph? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, yeah, I don't remember exactly mathematics how much of these things uh, they are explained. So, uh, for every function, so for every function, I can define another function yeah. that is the Fourier transform, right? And this uh, Fourier transform, now the variable of this uh, Fourier transform is in, in terms of uh, frequency in terms of this uh, W. So in the right, I'm representing the Fourier transform, the, well, I'm representing, sorry, I'm representing the modulus of the Fourier transform yeah, because the Fourier transform can be complex. So I'm representing in here, for these functions, I'm representing the modulus of the- So the X axis are the Ws and the Y axis are the, the modulus, right? Right, 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 okay. right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, if the function uh, has low frequencies, uh, in here we are going to to have bigger values near zero. If the function has higher frequencies, we are going to have higher values uh, for the Ws. Okay. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, the functions in this uh, kind of reducing uh, Hilbert space. In terms of frequencies, the has to decrease very, very quick, right? And that so this is in terms of uh, frequencies, in terms of the original, in terms of the original x, it means that the function uh, can have high frequencies, but very, very uh, small high frequency component. Okay. okay, so they are 
basically they have to be somehow smooth. Okay. All right, and that's the, we also saw this uh, before when I was doing this uh, video combining multiple Gaussian bells, but I think this is more clear, uh, at least for people used to Fourier analysis. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, maybe now, because finishing here is like, maybe let's, let's do, I mean, I mean, you might be wondering, okay, why, why is this um, coming from uh, and so on? So let's let's see, let's see why is that the case uh, and so on. Because otherwise it's just making bigger. So let's uh, do a little bit the. Uh, Let's, I don't know if proof is the right uh, word, but let's see why is this uh, the Gaussian kernel here space with the Gaussian kernel. Okay, so the, 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 the set is going to be defined like this in terms of the Fourier transform uh, decreasing very quickly. The inner product, uh, the inner product uh, is defined as follows. One over square root of two pi sigma infinity and in here we will have the Fourier transform of F, the Fourier transform of D uh, conjugate and then uh, the exponential of minus W uh, divided by sorry, two square then we so this is so this is the definition of the inner product here. Um, you can, I mean, the fact that the, this uh, this set with this inner product gives you a Hilbert space is something that can be shown using usual uh, functional analysis properties. This is basically like a L two uh, inner product weighted by this uh, weighted by this function here. Okay, so then basically what I'm going to do is to show that uh, uh, the Gaussian kernel is uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space for this uh, Hilbert space. So we have, so this is uh, the set, this is the inner product. You can believe that this is a Hilbert space or uh, checking in some book. Yeah. So uh, in the inner product, in the exponential, it's one half W uh, sigma, right? Or omega sigma? Uh, omega sigma, yes. Omega sigma and then one half. Yeah, omega sigma is a square and the one half is not a square. Uh, we are going to see in a minute why this is coming from, where this is coming from, but yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's do that. So if we want to show that this uh, Hilbert space is the RKHS corresponding to the kernel uh, to the Gaussian kernel, we have to do two things. Uh, so first of all, we need to show that uh, for every X, the section is in H, meaning that we have to check that the exponential, um, that exponential, uh, we are doing everything in the real, so this is going to be, X so this is a function of X. Uh, so we are going to show that uh, this as a function of X is in this set, meaning it satisfies it. So this is the first thing we have to do. This as a function of X is uh, one of the functions in there for every for every and then the second thing that uh, we will do is that if we do the inner product of any f in here with the section corresponding with the Gaussian kernel, we actually have the reproducing property and we get there. So this is basically using characterization to work. This the product is complex. The well, yeah, okay. So 
Uh, I have been considering functions uh, from x to the real, right? Um, this the inner product, the inner product here, I mean, can be complex. Uh, the thing is that the the I'm considering only real value functions. Right? So I'm considering only real value functions. So the inner product is uh, is going to be a real number, right? So if you remember, so the, I think it's called Parseval. So the Parseval equality, right? So basically, doing the inner product in the in the space of X or in the Fourier domain is going to be the same, right? And in here, I'm just waiting by a by a function, right? So yeah, okay, that's that's a good question. So basically, everything I have done can be also done considering functions from X to the complex numbers. In terms of machine learning, at least uh, we are going to stay in the in the real, real. Okay. Okay. So these are the two things that we want to prove. Uh, so let's uh, do the first one. Maybe. Where do I do the first one? Okay. Let's let's do it. Uh, let's do it uh, here, if I have room. So the first one. Uh, in order to do the first one, I need to do the Fourier uh, transform of uh, these guys. So for the Gaussian kernel, what happened with the Gaussian kernel is that the, the kernel is uh, given by some function of the difference between the x. This happens for many kernels, and this is uh, when this happens, uh, People call the kernel shift invariant. Yeah. So in, in, in this case, the, this function phi is this uh, Gaussian bell, right? But you know the in for other kernels, it's a different uh, type of function. Okay, so let's keep going. So then uh, the Fourier transform for every x prima of this function of x, right? So for every x prima, I'm going to have a function in w that is going to be the Fourier transform. If you remember from your Fourier analysis, when if we do this um, uh, shift in the variable, when we do the Fourier transform, this becomes the exponential of minus i times uh, the amount of shift times w, and then the Fourier transform of the function in this case by property of Fourier analysis. Uh, okay, so then uh, now if we if we do the modulus of that, so we are trying to see if this satisfies this stuff. So if we do the modulus of this, this complex exponential is going to disappear, and then we will have the the uh, this uh, or the Fourier transform of uh, phi square and then that exponential square divided by two w right in here the function x the function pi of x is the exponential of uh, one minus half uh, x divided by sigma uh, squared. So that the Fourier transform of this is one of the typical examples of the Fourier transform is sigma, or well, it's also going to be an exponent uh, Gaussian bell, but now what happens is that the sigma instead of dividing um, is, uh, Multiplying uh, sigma w squared very right. This is, uh, uh, if you remember from your uh, Fourier analysis from classes, this is a typical example of a Fourier transform of a function. So if we go here, we get the integral when the sigma doesn't change the fact that it's finite or not. And then when we make the square there, uh, 
if we make the well this is a real number if we so the modulus is uh, just itself if we make the square this uh, two here disappears and then we are multiplying by the same thing positive and uh, with one half so we get uh, the exponential of minus sigma where divided by w so this is basically, I mean, and now you might be guessing what's going on here, right? So basically, uh, we choose to put here basically the, the Fourier transform of the kernel, right? So, So, okay, okay. Let's let's make the comment now. So, so basically, what I was thinking to 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 say is that this type of construction that we have done for the Gaussian kernel can be done for many other uh, kernels, changing the function that we put here. Right? So, in so we can so we can consider functions in which the frequency components decrease exponentially or some uh, functions in which the frequency component decrease um, polynomially or in a different uh, uh, shape. And the difference is going to be the function that we put uh, here. And that will uh, um, um, correspond to a different uh, type of kernel. OK, so the first thing is done. Uh, we have shown that the, the sections are in this uh, Hilbert space. Now let's check the reproducing property. Can I ask you? Sure, sure, sure. Why you said that when you take the modulus, the exponential of minus i x w disappear? Well, because the modulus of this is one, right? So the modul the, the modulus of the product is the product of the modulus, and yeah. then the modulus of this is uh, one, right? So the exponential of a complex is uh, mm, okay, yes, right? So the 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 modulus of this is. Uh, is one. All right. So now let's do. Where should I do it? Yeah, let's do it here. So that okay, this might be useful. So the second thing is going to be also very. It's going to be even more simple. I start removing this, but I realized I need it. So let, let's do two now. So to do two, let, let's let's do this inner product uh, with the the recipe for the inner product. So the inner product between F and the section is going to be <coughs> one square root of two pi sigma. And in here you have this the Fourier transform of F, uh, and then the Fourier transform of the section. We just did it before, it's going to be the exponential of uh, minus i w x times the Fourier transform of uh, phi. And then we do the conjugate, and then we divide that by this exponential. I am running. Okay, so I'm just writing what the inner product, the recipe for the inner product. So now let's uh, simplify everything. Uh, okay, so the, so this is a real number. So the conjugate is uh, itself. And now this, uh, this uh, Fourier transform, I just uh, remove it, but it's, uh, this exponential times sigma. So this, this, and um, this uh, cancel. It was just what I wrote before. And then the conjugate of the exponential is uh, just uh, changing the sign in the exponent. <clears throat> Conjugate of the exponential is just changing the sign, and then the other things uh, simplify. So then this uh, quantity is uh, 
the inverse uh, Fourier transform so that uh, this is F evaluated at X and then we have that uh, we have the resolution problem. Okay. So this is just showing that the Gaussian kernel is actually the kernel corresponding to this Hilbert space. So the functions in the in that kernel are exactly the function that uh, satisfy this quantity here. Um, some more comments. Well, uh, before I said that basically this sigma describes uh, how smooth are, uh, how much high frequency content we have, right? So if uh, this is big, if this is big, uh, we have less high frequency content. And if this is small, we have more high frequency content. Uh, the other aspect that controls the smoothness of the functions here is the norm. So if we do the, the norm in this uh, uh, reproducing kernel here with the space, basically what we are doing, what we are doing is uh, doing the modulus. So this quantity here basically is the, the modulus, right? So that's when we divide by this, it's here. It's basically the modulus uh, without this constant, right? So basically uh, a function that has a large uh, norm is going to have more high frequency content than a function that has a smaller norm. Okay, just because if the norm is big, means this this quantity is big, meaning that we are going to have more high uh, frequency content. And when this is a small, the function is going to be smoother. And so this is something that happens in the in the Gaussian kernel theory spaces, the norm of the function controls the smoothness. So if this is a small a small norm, it means uh, means uh, smoother. Yes. This equation, because it's an interpretation, but specifically what happens, and this is going to be important then later uh, when we go back to machine learning. Okay, so this is basically everything I wanted to say. This construction, as I said, can be done for many other uh, uh, kernels. Uh, and then let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's do five minutes more. So let's just do five minutes more. Now, I think all the, all the equations and so on uh, for today are over. So I'm just going to make a couple of uh, comments and then tomorrow we can start with the machine learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first comment is about the, the fact that we can do this construction for uh, many other kernels. So basically we can do this construction for kernels that are a shift invariant, basically because uh, Okay, a theorem called Bosch-Bosch theorem. I'm not going to prove, but it, this theorem is going to be useful later. So Bosch theorem basically says that um, uh, if I have a function, <clears throat> if I have a function that is defined uh, using another function phi and taking the difference between the, the axes, this function is a, a positive type or a positive definite, positive type or positive definite, if and only if uh, is, the, is the Fourier transform of a, of a positive uh, positive measurement. This will be useful later. So basically uh, what this says is that uh, um, this function phi has to be if and only if phi is the Fourier transform of a positive measure, basically this uh, phi has to be given as the exponential of uh, 
So basically, uh, as long as uh, we define phi using some uh, uh, positive measure, we are sure that the corresponding kernel is going to be actually a kernel. So we can do this uh, for, for any choice. So we can choose any positive function here. We can do the, the Fourier transform, and that will give us a kernel. So for Basically, for any distribution, we can get a we can get a kernel using this uh, theorem, and then we can use the construction I said before. I wanted to. I mean, this theorem is not really. I mean, for what I said today is not very important, but it's going to be useful uh, tomorrow or the day after. So this is one result. Uh, other thing I wanted to measure. I want, I want to. I want to say is that. Uh, is something that I mentioned before, which is that these uh, Hilbert spaces are a very large set of functions. So indeed, for instance, the Hilbert space corresponding to the Gaussian kernel uh, can approximate uh, any continuous function. When that happens, the, the kernel is called universal. So, if x is compact, for this we need x to be compact. So if x is compact, uh, we say that the reproducing kernel of Hilbert dead space uh, H or the uh, kernel K is a universal universal. If um, for any for any continuous function f uh, and uh, any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a function in the reversing kernel space such that the difference between f of x and f hat in x is smaller than epsilon, and this happens for any x. Saying so, uh, that uh, using a universal universal representative space, we can approximate any continuous function defined in the, in the compact spaces with as much accuracy as uh, we like. Uh, and the, 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 the why I say this is because many, 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 oops, many kernels are universal. Many kernels are universal. For instance, the Gaussian kernel is universal. For any, for any scaling parameter. Okay, so this is somehow interesting. So basically, this says that uh, using this type of representing kind of human species, we can approximate any continuous function. And many kernels satisfy this, uh, for instance, Gaussian kernel and, and many others. Uh, and I think this can be a good point to finish so that. I finish with all the content about the between and tomorrow we can start with the uh, machine.